Hey folks, welcome back. Despite the gloomy weather out here, I got a nice dry spot. Although I'm not exactly dry because I just got in from the rain, but I've got a nice dry spot here and I'm basically sitting out on the porch of the tiny house. Now, if you're new to the channel, welcome aboard. If you're not new, you've probably seen this get built. You've heard about it, but I'm going to show you a little bit more about what I touched on yesterday. What I talked about yesterday or my previous episode was building with green lumber. Now I am sitting on a chair that was not built with green lumber, but the building behind me, the actual tiny house was. Now building with green lumber, as you saw in that previous episode, has its own set of challenges, but at the end of the day, it's completely doable. You just gotta be careful with some of the techniques you use. Now I'm not gonna go over those techniques again, but I would encourage you to check out that video. And if I can remember, I'll put it at the end of this video so you can click on it. Anyways, I'm just gonna show you a few things up close and more or less illustrate how after time goes by, uh, green wood will shrink and it will crack and it'll cause a few little minor things. So if we start off, let's have a look at this post. Okay, now this post is obviously a four by four. It's an actual four inch by four inch. This is good and dry now. It's probably been up for oh, over a year now. Remember how I was talking about cracks and splits? That is a prime example of what you can expect I put this up green as it shrunk it essentially created this little crack now as you can tell it's not overly deep I don't know what that is oh maybe a quarter inch maybe less and it doesn't go up the whole log it's only on that one side it might be on this side as well oh, I got a little one up there but it's not too bad right so just expect that with uh, with posts with green lumber for posts if we come back here just a little bit I want to bring you back to the lap siding and here's the lap siding and Although I do, uh, I do have a Woodland Mills lap siding attachment now, and that thing works spectacular. Check out that video if you want to see that go on. This is essentially lap siding without the taper. So this board, see how the thickness here is, I think it's three quarters of an inch or one inch. That's the actual thickness under the other, under the other piece of siding as well. It's in a lap format though. And check this out. Well, let's see if we can get down here. No, not down there. Head on up there. Okay. See that? See that gap there? See that gap right there? And see the gap right here where my finger is? So when I installed this, oh, especially right there. When I installed this, this board was sitting flat on top of that board. That board was flat on top of that board, etc., etc., etc. Now, as the wood dries, this wood does tend to curl a little bit depending on how you install it. For me, I probably wasn't as careful as I could have been. To be honest with you, it's not a huge deal. Probably what I would do at this point, come along with some more nails and I might just put a face nail here and here at both ends. And what that'll do, it'll just draw the board down. Now under an overhang here, it doesn't really matter. Out here, I probably should have been a little more careful. And to be honest, I might have been, I can't remember. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, I got some gaps, some gaps underneath here. But anyways, if you put the cup of the board, especially when it's green, put the cup, facing the building like so as it as it curls if it is going to curl what it'll do it'll go from flat and it'll cup like this but it won't create a seam like that okay and that's if it cups now some other things you're going to notice building with green lumber see the trim work i sort of did here i put two by fours just to give an edge for the siding to butt up to see the two by fours here this was a tight joint here that was perfectly tight when i built it you do get some shrinkage, so you're going to get gaps like that opening up. Not a big deal, but that is sort of the reality. Now, another thing I'm going to show you guys is right here. Let's have a look at this post, and I'll get back up here. This post, this 4x4 here, and if we take a step back, you can see what it's used for. The 4x4 there, it goes from the ground all the way up to support this beam. Now, I probably should have had some sort of bracket here to support the post against the beam. I just toenailed it. Well, good enough for now, I suppose. But regardless of doing that, when this post dried, it actually twisted a little bit. And I don't know if you guys can tell, if we get down here and have a look-see, you guys see how that is perfectly flush against this board? There's no gap there. Watch as you follow this upwards. See how it starts to twist? And then ultimately you get up to the top here and you can see a clear twist in the, in the post. That's going to happen with green wood. It's not a big deal. To be honest with you, as long as the post is underneath the beam, it's still providing the support you need. In reality, a perfect world, I would have put some sort of a metal bracket up here. 
Uh, maybe I'll get around to it, maybe I won't, but that's to be expected. Now you guys may be able to see this, you may not be able to see it, so you'll have to believe me, and I'm a believable guy, okay? This post right here is attached to the essentially the floor of the entire building here. This post is held in place with these bolts, okay? So these bolts go through this board here and then the nuts on the other side. If you can imagine here, see this joint? If you look really closely, there's a little bit of a gap there. It's not much, but when I rock this, I can feel it moving slightly. That was not the case when I first installed this green. As I mentioned in my other video dealing with green lumber, you may have to come back in certain circumstances and tighten up bolts, especially in that situation, because as the wood shrinks, obviously what you had tight is no longer perfectly tight. So I'm gonna come back, go underneath and just tighten down those nuts. That post will be just good as new. Now let's hop on down here. Oh, as the rain starts, we'll try to hide under the uh, overhang. Let's have a look at these deck boards. Now these deck boards, I think they're five inches wide. Uh, they're one inches thick. I think they're one inch thick. Anyways, I put these down green just like the rest of the lumber. And uh, one thing to note here, have a look down there. Notice how the gaps have opened up. This is gonna be what happens with the sawmill shack, the deck I just put down. You're gonna see these gaps. When I put this wood down, it was green. I put the gaps complete, or I put the uh, boards rather, completely tight against each other, knowing that as the board dried, it was gonna shrink and create these gaps. Don't pre-gap your boards, so don't leave these gaps while it's green, because then you're gonna get an even bigger gap and you're probably not gonna be happy with it. Another thing you're gonna notice with this, just like the sawmill shack, it's sort of worn in here a little bit. If you guys have a look down there, down there, see how I've got one fastener here, one fastener there, one fastener right in the middle of the board, just like I did at the sawmill shack. As a result, these boards are now perfectly dry. There's no cracking and they look pretty good if you ask me. All right, guys, let's have a little look at some deck boards here. And as you can tell, I've got deck boards laid out all the way across here. They are fastened just like I fastened around the edge of the building, which we'll have a look at in a minute. Now, I want to talk to you guys not so much about where to place the nails or the screws for fastening, more so about which way to put the board. Now, the boards can be placed with essentially the outside part of the board or the bark side facing upwards or conversely facing downwards. If you put it the wrong way, you're going to get something called cupping. And I'm not afraid to show you where I've made some errors. My memory's good, but it's pretty short. So I probably forgot to do this when I first was installing it. I was probably getting excited because I was getting close to done. But here's what the result is. If we look at this particular board here, here is essentially where the center of the tree is going to be, somewhere down here. This would be the bark side up top. If you put bark side facing up, what, look what's going to happen. You're going to get cupping like this. Now what can happen if this was maybe not covered by an overhang, you could have water sit in here. That's not what you want. You want this. You want cupping, but you want it down. Cupping down is called a crown. Have a look at this particular board. If I were to put my finger right about where the middle of the board is, you can tell the bark side would be facing downwards, downwards towards the framing. Bark down, you get a crown. You want a crown because then it's curved like this. Any rainwater that collects will just bead off. In contrast, you have bark side up like this. Here's bark side. You're going to end up with a cup and a cup holds water. So not most ideal. Just a little tip if you're building with green lumber, do it this way, not this way. Now let's step back out in the rain here. I'm not sure why I was already wet today and now I was trying to get dry, but regardless, we're out here in the rain so that we can get a good look at the tiny house. And boy, that is a beautiful thing. Isn't that nice? I could practically live out here if I could have just a few more amenities. Anyways, this is a beautiful spot and why I wanted to take a step back is just to, uh, just to show you a few things and talk about one important thing. Now, many of you guys mentioned when I was building my sawmill shack, not this, but my sawmill shack, that I shouldn't have it sitting or floating on blocks. And I agree with you, having it set on some concrete piers four feet down beneath the frost line is probably the ideal situation. But let's face it, time, money gets in the way, effort, I don't want to do it. And so I didn't. This behind me, this tiny house, is a prime example of what you can do by putting blocks down on well-drained soil. This right here is obviously built on a hill. I have blocks here with well-drained soil underneath and nothing more. 
There is no concrete foundation under this. And to be honest with you, the winters here in central Ontario are vicious. I've had feet of snow to the point where I walk off the deck and I walk into the snow pile. I can practically in the winter time, pull the snow machine up behind here and step onto the deck. It's brutal. So do you always have to have a concrete foundation? No. Should you have one? Probably, I'm not gonna lie, it's probably better, but you don't always have to. Let's get a look down here and just see exactly what I did and how it could potentially work for you if you're building a tiny house or maybe even a sawmill shack like I'm in the midst of. Now let's head on down here. And if we have a little look-see, you guys are gonna notice I got a few things going on here besides some storage for my ladder. I've got three main beams here, one, two, and three over there. I also end up having a lot of posts. I got 12 of these posts. You can see them right here, 12 of them, four, four, and four. In addition to that, I got a heck of a lot of bracing. Because this is built onto a hill, and this is a pretty good load here, pretty good jag as I like to say, I wanna make sure the bracing is absolutely solid. I got it braced this way, I got it braced that way. Okay, so on well-drained soil like I've got here, I simply have blocks. The blocks are holding up the post, the post is supporting the beam, the beam supports the rest of the building. Is it ideal? Well, for me, yes. This has been like this for, well, for quite a while now, definitely gone through some winter, and it has definitely gone through some weather. This went through the tornado, folks. Let's not, uh, let's not get carried away here. A tornado is a substantial bit of wind. If this thing was gonna go anywhere, I would imagine it would have gone somewhere during the tornado because the tornado, it was blowing. And honestly, it blew so much, it was breaking the top off of trees, you know, 100 feet over there. So the wind that was hitting this thing was substantial. All right, so this thing is solid. Is it gonna move in the long term? Probably. If you can imagine frost, frost does, well, if there's moisture, it does expand and the expansion causes the soil to raise a little bit potentially. If this block is on top of that soil, well, this block's gonna move. What's gonna happen if it moves? Well, I'm not too concerned. What I can do if it moves, I'm just gonna let it come back down in the spring as it melts and uh, settles. If it turns out to be a problem, well, maybe in a video from uh, maybe a few years down the road from now, I'll. Tell my or I uh, tell you guys I was uh, I was wrong, but at this point I'm feeling pretty good. I'm feeling pretty confident. I hope I don't eat my words, but just so you understand, this thing has stood the test of time. It's gone through winter. It's gone through a tornado. It is simply post on block with well-drained soil. All right, so that looks pretty slick. And just before I leave that topic there, for those of you who don't quite understand how frost works, maybe you're fortunate and you live somewhere like Florida and you're sitting on the beach right now laughing at me. It's getting down to freezing right now at night and it's pretty rainy i'm just about ready for snow and anyways if you're on that beach and you're laughing at me how frost works is it will get into the soil underneath of things like these blocks and as the moisture stays there and goes into the freezing cycle it'll expand that expansion which takes up more volume than a liquid will cause that block to move if it moves too much then we got problems obviously if it moves upwards the building which is attached to it is going with it Frost will move a heck of a lot of weight. It'll move a house. So it'll definitely move this. That's what frost is. Anyways, I should probably say if this thing does move, which I guess it probably will, but if it moves too much, I'm simply going to shim some of the posts so that they're firmly back on the blocks. Has that happened? No. Has it come close to happening? No. Have I checked it? Yes. This thing is solid. I'm hoping the same thing holds true for my sawmill. As I mentioned, if it doesn't, well, I'm gonna eat my words and I'm not too proud. I'll definitely tell you if I screwed up. But at this point, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm gonna roll the dice and let's just hope I come out a winner. Now, as I stand here and sort of reminisce at the pain and suffering it took to build this, to be honest with you, it was kind of fun. But as I sit here and reminisce about it, I start to think about one additional thing I wanna tell you guys about when building with green lumber. Now, building with green lumber is great. I definitely do it 99% of the time, but I tend to focus in on one type of fastener. I tend to focus on a fastener that is going to grip the wood. Now, this wood is going to contract, as I mentioned, or shrink down. When it shrinks down, it's going to pull, right? It's gonna be pulling on your fasteners, especially if you're dealing with stuff like deck boards, right? We talked about crown and cup and all that jazz. If you have something like a common nail, it's going to move a little bit with it. If it doesn't have a good grip on that board, as the wood moves, well, it might just pull it with it. We don't want that, obviously, because then you're gonna get squeaky boards. So what do I do is I use a nail, but I don't use any nail, I use an Ardox nail. It's 
got a little spiral on it. That Ardox nail is great, driver home, and it grabs on and holds. So those Ardox nails are just what the doctor ordered for framing. And to be honest, I use Ardox nails sometimes for decking, as is the case at the sawmill. Sometimes I don't use Ardox nails. What I use is I use screws. Now, as long as you're putting that screw in the center of the board, especially when you're doing deck boards or even siding, you're not going to crack it. If you start driving home the screws, well, you can expect to have cracked boards. For me, though, if we get back to framing, I don't like to frame anything unless I'm using framing nails. For me, framing nails consists of three and a half inch galvanized Ardox nails. For you, you might be using engineered screws, which have a very high shear factor, but that's a story for another day. Anyways, that's my two cents dealing with green lumber. I can just about feel the water dripping down my back right about now. I'm going to get back into my tractor, crank up the tunes, and hopefully I still got a little bit of coffee left. If you guys have any questions, put it down below. Be sure to check out my build here, the tiny house. This thing was a joy. Well, most of the time it was a joy to build. It's more of a joy now to use. So check out that build. I'll put the video at the end of this one for you to click on. If you haven't seen my other build, my sawmill shack, sawmill shed, version 2.0, the hillbilly hideout, I would encourage you to check that out as well. Guys, you all take care, stay warm, stay dry, and I'll see you next time.